Let's talk about weight and balance. Now, ensuring that a glider, or any aircraft for that matter, is within its prescribed limit for both the weight and the location of its center of gravity, or balance, is important for the safety, structural integrity, and the handling characteristics of the aircraft. A glider that is overweight is not only overweight by the additional pounds on board, but also by that amount times any G-load imposed on the aircraft. The Schweitzer 233, for example, is certified to over 4.6 Gs. Therefore, being 20 pounds overweight could potentially equate to being 90 pounds overweight in case of strong turbulence or abrupt maneuvering. Higher weights also increase the stall speed and other performance speeds. The balance portion determines the center of gravity, or CG. It's important because it ensures that the stability and maneuverability are within acceptable limits. Being outside these limits may result in insufficient elevator maneuvering authority, for example, to recover from a stall or spin, or to flare for landing. In normal flight, because the CG is forward of the center of lift, the tail must exhibit a downforce. This arrangement is important for reasons already mentioned. A forward CG requires a little more downforce to maintain level flight than a further aft CG, and thus generates a little more drag. Many racing pilots will try to optimize the CG location to reduce the required downforce and associated drag by loading the glider so that the CG is toward the aft quarter or so of the envelope. Loading a calculated amount of water in the tail ballast is a common method. Calculating the weight portion is pretty obvious. Just add the weight of the empty glider and everyone and everything we put in it. Calculating the balance portion requires considering the weight and the position of each added person or other item. The position is expressed using the term arm, which is simply the distance from a reference point on the glider known as the datum. Then we use the formula weight times arm equals moment and add up all the values in the weight and the moment columns. Then divide the total moment by the total weight to get the fully loaded center of gravity. We then compare the total weight to the weight limit and the CG to the allowable CG range. Many times an extra ballast weight has to be added to bring the CG into the allowable range. Ballast might be a weight in a designated ballast holder or simply adding weight under the pilot's seat. Ballast may also be carried as water in the wings, fuselage, and tail. This type of ballast is usually added for the sole purpose of increasing the weight often by several hundred pounds in order to increase the cruise speed while maintaining glide ratio. If the CG of the empty glider is not given, we can determine it by the weights measured on the main and tail wheels while in a level position or as prescribed in the glider's operating handbook. These weights will be noted in the aircraft logbook whenever it's weighed. You may also see a formula used that uses the distance from the main wheel to the tail wheel. This may be confusing because the measurements are then taken from the main wheel and not the datum. While the math may not be easy to follow, it is of course a valid method. It's based on the principle that the center of gravity for the empty aircraft will be between the two wheels. Then the distance from the datum to the main wheel is added to produce the CG in relation to the datum point. For simplicity's sake, the calculation of the CG by total weight and total moment works too. For any glider, you'll need to know the minimum or maximum weight of the pilot and any equipment carried aboard to stay within limits. Or you may need to know the minimum or maximum the person in the other seat can weigh and still have the glider within limits. The limiting factor may be any of the maximum total weight for the glider, the maximum weight limit for that seat, or the allowable CG range. The minimum and maximum weight to stay within the CG can be calculated by solving for the weight needed at a pilot station to achieve the forward or aft CG limit. Though in practice it may be easier to simply use a spreadsheet and trial and error to determine these weights, a formula similar to the following also works. Here we have the weight to meet a CG location. where We take the empty weight times the distance from the empty CG to the limit CG divided by the distance from the pilot seat to the limit CG. Usually the minimum weight is calculated to move forward of the aft CG limit and the maximum weight is determined to avoid exceeding the forward CG limit. 
For a two-place glider, if you substitute the weight and the CG with one pilot seat occupied, you can derive the maximum or minimum weight for the other occupant. The front seat will usually have a narrower allowable range than a back seat, since it's farther from the center of gravity. In addition to the total weight limit, many gliders that can hold water ballast in the wings will have an additional weight limit for the non-lifting parts. The non-lifting parts are loads that are hung from the wings and add to their bending moment. This includes everything except the wings and the ballast contained within them. The wings themselves and the water ballast within them are supported spanwise by the wings. While the weight affects performance, it doesn't significantly stress the wing structure of the wing fuselage attachments. A glider that has this limitation will have the weight of the lifting and non-lifting parts, the wings, noted in the logbook weight and balance entry. Many manufacturers provide charts to help the operator determine the allowable weights and ballast to be carried. They are intended as a convenience, even though they may seem more complicated at first. You should use caution to make sure that they are not based on an empty weight that is not accurate for the individual glider being flown. If in doubt, the basic weight times arm equals moment calculation always works too. Remaining within the weight and balance limitation are critical for the safety and handling of any aircraft. It's every pilot's responsibility to understand those limits and apply them to each aircraft they fly. All of the formulas used in this video and other great soaring links can be found on my new soaring resources page, thesoaringpage.com. Check it out. Safe soaring and thanks for watching.